I'm Jackie Swihart and I'm here on behalf of NCPH and IUPUI Public History. I am sitting here with Heather Hike, and her session today was called Arming Citizens, Public Historians and Civic Engagement. You want to tell me a bit about your professional background? I grew up in a family where we visited parks all the time. My mother was a journalist and we were mercilessly dragged from national park to national park. And I knew that there was a great deal of history in those parks. And so I knew that I wanted to be a history major in college. I was then went on to grad school at the University of Minnesota. Got a little sidetracked in getting my master's in cultural anthropology and my doctorate in American history. And so in the process was doing a lot of other public history. I put my Park Service uniform on a half hour before my final oral. So I was living this double life in a time when we didn't have the phrase public history, and yet I knew I wanted to do it. So I was very fortunate. I ended up with the Park Service right out of grad school. I then ended up at Claire Bart National Historic Site. My field had started in colonial history, ended up in women's history and public history, obviously. And so at that point, I went into the Park Service at Claire Barton, moved into the Washington office, and then later ended up working for the Subcommittee on National Parks and Public Lands in the House of Representatives for eight and a half years, and did about 80 pieces of enacted legislation. And then leaving that, I ended up going back to the Park Service, doing strategic planning, and then ended up at the William College of William & Mary as contingent faculty. So I think I'm a good example of someone who, as a public historian, has done a great variety of things. Mm -hmm. I have um, done a, a furnishing plan for the schoolhouse Herbert Hoover allegedly attended. I have worried about the number of foot candles on the Derringer that shot Lincoln. I have done all kinds of women's history, and I have seen that as a way of serving my country, our I country. Agree. Yeah, that's very, very cool. So. Going back to your session today, um, I want to know what are the three main takeaways from the session that you want the audience to walk away thinking about, either from the session or from your specific um, talk? I particularly care that in terms of visitation, people who are at historic sites have a tendency to think the site belongs to them. Mm -hmm. We live in them. We're there every day, we care about them intensely. We have to switch. We have to change from seeing ourselves as owners to seeing ourselves as hosts and co-creating with the visitor. That means you can't give a canned speech. You have to work with their questions. You always analyze your, your audience and you always analyze who the visitors are. But this is taking it further. So that would be the first thing, to practice hospitality not tolerance. The second piece would be that you really have to tell the whole story. And if you don't tell the whole story, the first thing that happens is it's crummy history, and that's being very polite. The second thing that happens is you really write out all kinds of people in, out of the story. And usually in my field that's been women being written out of American history, and I say that without women's history it's not the real story. But I'm a little concerned right now that with the story of suffrage coming up in two years, that we're not telling the story of the men. Because we forget that it took men voting affirmatively for women to get the vote. That was something you mentioned in the session today about how, um, I forget how exactly you said it, but it kind of angers you that men are excluded from this narrative. And as, as women, we try to kind of hold women's history tight and not share it with anyone else. But you think it's important to do so. Well, I don't think it's that men are so excluded. It's that we haven't worked enough to invite them. There are men, I've once, we, I've been a part of a group, the National Collaborative for Women's History Sites, we did four webinars with the National Park Service, and I was showing a long-term friend, uh, of the, a male of the species, as my husband says, um, and I just wanted to show his wife the whole thing, and I said, would you like to see it? And his answer was, so it's not, I mean, there are men who aren't interested, and I think what I'm saying is we need to find ways to reach that audience 
for sustainability, we need to find ways to have them feel welcome. But this is history that belongs to them as well. So it's not that we're trying to keep them out, but mm -hmm. sometimes we get so excited about what we're finding that we forget we have to really reach out. And that's, in terms of suffrage, they were the ones who voted that we could get the vote. They also beat us up. Um, there was a woman so beaten up that when her husband came to visit her after a month at the Occoquan workhouse, he didn't recognize his wife. Uh, that's pretty hardcore. So I, th I think it's that piece. So the first would be the to hospitality. The second would be telling the whole story. I think the third thing is to think about historic sites. And I'm finishing a book on interpreting women's history for historic sites and museums. So think about them in terms of the tangible resources, the, the landscapes, the structures, the buildings, the artifacts. Think about them in terms of the landscapes, the larger piece, and then think about them in terms of objects. And then the fourth piece is the audience. So you really want these, you need to take care of all four pieces in order to do a good job. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. A question I, I asked to the other panelists in your session today that I wanted to ask you about more specifically is if you were preparing classroom materials to go along with your talk, what would you include um, in terms of historical events, primary, secondary sources, and activities? I have found that doing projects makes a big difference. And I would really, I agree with, with Aaron, Aaron Devlin that I would probably start with oral history. I would probably start, I had one class years ago, I said to everybody, please collect everything on paper that's in your life for the next week. And they thought that was a silly assignment and too easy. And of course they discovered that that's a huge amount of paper and then I used that quote collection to process to help them understand what it was and w what primary sources are. So I would do that. Wow. Or have them go to a historic site and really ask a different set of questions. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of things that you can do in terms of making a classroom. I'm actually more focused on what the general public does and ha ways to learn. I just went to a session on augmented reality and we've struggled for years on all the buildings that don't survive but are really important. And so we just saw an example at the Lincoln home of a, a Draymond's home, a very simple home, someone who had escaped slavery. And that home hadn't survived, but we can now use augmented reality to quote, reconstruct. That has incredible opportunities. So using technology to do webinars, using it to do augmented reality, there's incredible opportunities that we didn't used to have. And it was uh, distance learning would be another example. So I would use all those things, but I really love the lifelong learner. Yeah, absolutely. What a great answer. Um, whose work would you say you're influenced by or building on? All of the, I mean, I, I build on everybody. Um, my advisor was Sarah Evans. She was very generous. I did an oral history dissertation when oral history was considered a little weird. Um, but I've, I go to as many national park sites as I can go to, and so I really have collected all those places. And if you're a public historian, the more places that you can go to of the past, those are good for life, mm -hmm. and they will help you be able to share them, and, and it's your own bird list. Yeah. And, and that's made a huge difference. So that's, I, I've. I've built on everybody I can find, and I'm very focused right now on finishing this book on women's history, so I just sort of um, do a lot in terms of the built environment in particular. Yeah. But you saw me in one point, I talked about how I'd been part of finding Maggie Walker's documents and working with a multiracial community. And I think it's really important to say and that community was mostly black. There were some whites, one Latina, and one Chinese American. And we had to really work some things through to get where we needed to be. I was the only person who had the techn technical expertise. Most people were coming, some had high school degrees, some had more. But I think it's a great example of a community working together, learning from each other. So I was functioning as a technical person but they were bringing knowledge that I would never have had access to. And I think we really were able to cross some chasms that are so 
horribly there racially yeah. that we would not have without focusing on the project rather than all the pain that they say. One of the women said, you know, I wish when I go to a grocery store that the clerk smiles at me like she does the person before me. And another woman says, I'm 60, I never had a white friend before. Yeah. I mean, the amount of pain and the amount of daily struggle is something I, I think we don't even begin to understand. So kind of a follow-up to that, um, I lost the thought, but it'll come back. Um, so in terms of like race, you were talking about that just being kind of a complicated thing. And in your session, you were saying, you know, not all white people are blonde hair, blue eyes, we're all different, um, that sort of conversation. So as public historians, when it comes to civic engagement, how do, we, how do we break those barriers? How do we get people to recognize similarities instead of the differences between them? in order to work together. We were very lucky, or in the black community, they would say blessed, to have this amazing collection where issues came up in processing the collection. So we had 30 boxes of, of Maggie Walker's papers, and we built a 23,000 item database out of that. So this we're talking nine years of work. And so in that process, issues would come up, they would ask questions, I would ask questions, I always went home exhausted. Mm -hmm. But I think it's, as public historians, it's putting yourself out there, it's finding people who are willing to trust you, and, and when you mess up, which you will, going back and saying, let's try again. One of the things that helps me the most in that situation, if someone tries to put on me, your people enslaved my people, I say, yes, but I didn't do it. I, can't, I wasn't there. There's nothing I can do to make a horrible situation then better. But it is my responsibility and my moral responsibility to do all I can now. And so when I do those kinds of projects, and it was a family joke, I would come home and fall asleep before the 7 o'clock news. You know, I was just exhausted from all the kind of questions that they pelted me with and the, how hard we all worked. We're talking about a dozen people all trying to do this stuff. So I think if you split what you can do something about and what you can't, and not take responsibility, and that you can't take credit then. I can't take credit for my ancestors, some of whom were pretty cool, and some of whom were probably horse thieves. Um, but, I can't, but I have to do what I can do now, and I think that's where the scholarship and the civic engagement and the activism come together and where from that experience and I've only moved a couple months ago so I'm missing them terribly they brought a richness to my life that I could only imagine and the easy way to say it is there a friend one of the women's husband died um, I was one of probably three whites out of 200 people and again I was very honored to be included yeah. It's a different world and a fabulous one. I'm sure. So we have just about three minutes left. So as a final question, um, what impact do you hope that this research and the presentation you gave today will have on the field? I hope it will give younger historians knowledge and skills on how to do things that I learned the hard way. That's why we did the handout. I hope it will help people know how wonderful it can be and that doing things hard that are hard to do still make them great to do. So I hope in the field and all of my work to bridge the, the gap that's still there between academic history and public history and to bridge some of these other gaps, racially, gender, and so on. That's who I am, I'm a bridge person. Very good, thank you so much. You're welcome, thank you. I appreciate it.